All right, so now we're going to get into session or the, the next session on Galatians chapter 1. And so having set the background in, in the introduction, we're not going to repeat any of that right now. But we want to go, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go verse by verse. I'm going to read the scriptures. And one of the reasons I'm going to read the, every, every one of the scriptures is because I know some people may not be able to, they're so busy with work and things like that, they may not be able to, to read the Bible themselves they might, you know, they might just drive on their, in their commute. So I'm going to read the scriptures verse by verse and then give commentary as we go through it and what Paul is saying here. So we start now with the introduction, uh, Galatians 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so in verse 1, you can already see, okay, Paul is a little bit defensive. You see that? You see the tone there? He's a little bit defensive. He's like, you know, the, before I understood the context and the background of the Judaizers making false, false accusations against Paul, I read that. I was like, man, why is he so adamant that he's an apostle sent from God? And, you know, it, you know it's, it's not from any man. You know, there's a point to his argument here. He's, see, the Judaizers tore down his message by tearing down the messenger. And so Paul, in this letter to Galatians, to get his message to be received, has to convince the Galatians once again, the messenger is really from God. And so Paul's saying here, I, know, I'm, I didn't come through the agency of man. I didn't come through the 12. I didn't come from Jerusalem. I came from Antioch. I was sent by God himself. I have, I have direct revelation from the Lord himself. And so Paul has to build that back up here in verse 1. Verse 2. And to all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. And we mentioned in the introduction that the uh, churches of Galatia, the four churches that Paul planted, number one, Pisidian Antioch, number two, Iconium, number three, Lystra, and number four, Derbe. And you, if you read Acts chapter 13 through 14, you can see all of those all those, the, the different churches he planted on his first missionary journey. Verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom, whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Now we get into uh, chapter, or verse 6 where we're going to look at the, the perversion of the gospel by the Judaizers. Verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly des des deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So, so basically what was happening is the Galatians were desert... Deser I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking in tongues. They were abandoning Christ because the Judaizers... The Judaizers were saying that this gospel was not true. So they're abandoning this, this gospel that brought, Paul brought, and they're embracing uh, the, the gospel that is not only um, faith in Jesus Christ, but works of the law. And so Paul's like, how are you doing this? You're embracing a completely different gospel. The gospel that I brought to you, which was with signs and wonders and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the gospel that I brought to you, which God confirmed with signs and miracles and that resulted in your salvation, this gospel, you're leaving it to go place yourself back under the law. It's like, what are you doing? It was a different gospel. And Paul says, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. See, notice that word disturbing and distortion. Is the, the Judaizers were disturbing the Galatians. They were distorting the gospel and they were disturbing the Galatians. They, they were saying that this, pos, this, this incredible gospel that you think is so incredible, well, it's not really that good. 
They were distorting it. They were disturbing the Galatians. They were in total confusion. They're like, I don't know who to believe. Do we believe these Judaizers who come from Jerusalem, supposedly from James, or do we believe Paul, this guy from Antioch, who says he has direct revelation from God? You know, they were, they were in this turmoil. And so he says, the, the, uh, they basically, it is the distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Wow, that's some, that is heavy language. He goes on in verse 9, as we said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received from me, basically, he is to be accursed. That is strong language the see this is this is so uh, amazing i mean in, intense what paul's saying here is amazing is that if we want to preach a gospel of jesus christ plus anything else jesus christ plus obedience to the law jesus christ plus circumcision jesus christ plus uh compliance with the feast jesus christ plus dietary laws etc cetera, etc cetera, paul says beware if you go down that path because if you preach that gospel, you are under a curse. You're accursed. The Judaizers were accursed. Even though they believed he was the Messiah, they were accursed. Their gospel was a distortion. Their gospel was a false gospel. Their gospel was perverted. Man, that's strong. Oh, just any mixture of the pure, simple gospel of grace by faith in Jesus Christ for acceptance by him, and that sanctification comes by his spirit living in us and working in us and working through us, if we preach any other gospel, we are cursed. And that gospel today, you know, there's, there's definitely legalism, but there's a, there's a huge uh, momentum towards lawlessness of mixing the gospel with lawlessness and mixing the gospel with hyper grace and things like that. And, and Paul, I would say the same thing. If you are preaching a gospel of legalism or a gospel of lawlessness, you are accursed and you're bringing people under a curse. Some strong language. We need to get our gospel message correct. We need to get our gospel message straight so we're not under a curse. Verse 10, he says, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I now striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. See, again, Paul is answering the Judaizers. They're looking at Paul and they're, they're accusing him of being a man pleaser. And so even, even the Galatians likely wrote a letter to Paul and said, hey, you know, these Judaizers say you're a man pleaser. These Judaizers are saying that you're not really telling us the truth. These Judaizers are saying that, that faith plus works, you're leaving out the works part. You know, you're not, you're distorting it. And, and Paul's like, listen, I am not a man pleaser. I am not doing this by the fear of man. I am not doing this to try to make you feel better. I am, I am preaching the pure good news of Jesus Christ. He said, if I, was, if I was trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I am a bondservant of him. I am a bondservant of the lamb. I am the one, I am just, I am seeking only to please him. I am seeking only to obey him. And so, you know, one of the things that, that uh, Paul is really hitting at is the fear of man. Pro Proverbs 29, 25 talks about the fear of man brings a snare. If we are going to be preachers of the gospel, if we are going to proclaim the good news, if we want to be a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to be delivered from the fear of man. That doesn't mean we become rude. That doesn't mean we become insensitive. That doesn't mean we're not, you know, we're not, we're no longer are showing kindness and things like that. What it means is like we get to the point where it doesn't matter if people accept us or reject us, if they praise us or if they curse us. It does not matter. We want to please Jesus Christ and him alone. And that's where Paul was at. That's where we want to be as well. We want to be those people who are just, who are bound by this. We want to truly please him. 
He's the only, the only thing that matters in life is what he says about us, not what any man or woman says about us. Paul had reached that point, and that's the same place we need to be. In Galatians now, we're Galatians 1, 11 through 24, we're still seeing, as, as we go through this, Paul is defending his ministry still again. He, because here's the main thing Paul's trying to get at, is they attacked the messenger, and they accused the messenger to distort the message or to bring in a different gospel. So if I want you to get accept my message once again, I've got to build up the messenger. And Paul's not doing this out of pride. He's not doing this because he's insecure. He's doing it for the sake of the message. He's doing it for the sake of the gospel. It says in, in verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, again, he's answering that accusation. He's answering that accusation. What's so interesting here is in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, Paul basically said that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai in Arabia. And so many have thought, okay, Mount Sinai in Arabia is in e or Mount Sinai is in Egypt, but Paul's saying, no, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, is in Arabia. Here's what's interesting. Paul, so the, the old covenant was given on Mount Sinai in Arabia to Moses. Paul goes to Arabia for three years in the wilderness. He receives a direct revelation of Jesus Christ. He receives not only an external revelation of Jesus Christ, he receives an internal revelation, revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is being equipped in Arabia to be a messenger and a minister of the new covenant. Isn't that, isn't that interesting right there? Moses gets the law on Mount Sinai in Arabia, the old covenant, Paul gets the revelation of the new covenant by a revelation of Jesus Christ in Arabia, the same place Moses was. I'm not sure if it's the same mountain, who knows, but same area. So Paul is telling him, Paul is just saying, I received my gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I did not go to the apostles' teaching in Jerusalem. I did not go and get instructed by them and then go off and do my own thing. I was apprehended by Christ himself. I saw him and the shining bright light on the road to Damascus. He, he captured my heart. He captured me. He turned me around. He's, and then in the wilderness for three years, I was, I was caught up in the internal revelation of Jesus Christ where God the Father was revealing his son in me. And we'll see that here in a, in a minute. Verse 13 for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. And Paul, and, and I, hold on, I'll save it for a second. You, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And so he, he you know, Paul's basically saying, the law, you know, these guys want to come and bring you under the law. I was more zealous for the law than they were. They want to come and distort the gospel. They want to come and disturb you. But listen, I was way more zealous for the law than they were. I tried to destroy, from the law, I tried to destroy those who were preaching Jesus Christ. Is that I was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. No, verse 14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And so Paul's basically saying, you know, I, if they had zeal, if you think they have zeal, if you think they know the law, if you think they want to be blameless by the law, trust me, I was far more than them. There wasn't many people in the nation of Israel back then. There wasn't many people who were uh, seeking to obey the law more than I was. In fact, in Philippians, he says, I was blameless when it came to the law. I was... If any man could keep all 613 commandments, I was one of those guys. And Paul's telling them basically, hey, guys, listen, I've been there. I've done it. This, doesn't, this is not it. This is not it. This is not, you are not to go back under this 
old form of religion, this old, uh, you know, this, he called it the elementary teachings. You're not to go back under this law. I've been there. I've done it. This is not it. Jesus Christ is it. The revelation of Jesus Christ is what it is all about. Verse 15. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, verse 16, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So here we have Paul's calling. He's, he's set apart from the womb. It's just like Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the Lord said in Jeremiah 1.5, he says, before, um, before you were born, I knew you. And I set you apart as a prophet to the nations. Paul's basically saying the very same thing. Before I was born, God set me apart by his grace, predetermined in his plans you will be an apostle to the nations. You will be an apostolic witness. You will be a sent one, which is what the word apostle means. You will be a sent one that goes into the nations, that in particular into Gentile nations. It's interesting as well, Paul was seeking, before his conversion, he was seeking to destroy the church. And at the grace of God, he's seeking to destroy the church but there's probably been no one in history that has built up the church quite like, like the Apostle Paul. Isn't that the, the incredible grace of God? Paul seeking to destroy the church. God saves him. God converts him radically. And Paul becomes the greatest builder of the church in history, in all of church history, probably ever. But I want you to see here God's pleasure it's God's pleasure to reveal his son. That See, we don't get anything else. This is what it's all about. God's pleasure is in his son. The father said, the father's pleasure is in his son. Like in uh, Matthew chapter 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What pleases God? Jesus Christ. What pleases God when in us? Jesus Christ revealed in us. What pleases God in us? Jesus Christ conformed in us. What pleases God in us? Jesus Christ living rather than us. That's what pleases him. Not what we do for him, not what we try to gain acceptance by from him, not all the other stuff. It is Jesus Christ alone that pleases God. Jesus Christ revealed in me pleases him. See, all that we do of the flesh, it means nothing to God. Anything of the flesh profits us nothing. What pleases God is Jesus Christ. And, and Paul knew that. Paul's like, he's like, you know, God was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now, this is interesting. Paul doesn't say reveal his son to me. He says reveal his son in me. See, Paul already had an external revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's riding on the road to Damascus, and the light comes down, and he sees Jesus Christ shining like the sun. He has an external revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's already had that. Paul's basically saying, I had something uh, even deeper and even greater. It was, a, well, I don't know if it was greater, but it was you know, deeper because it went inside of him. The internal revealing of Jesus Christ. See, where God the Father, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, unveils Jesus Christ internally to us so that the eyes of our heart are open. And Paul wrote about this in, I think it's 2 Corinthians 3 or 4. He says, the God of light uh, spoke into the darkness. And he said, let there be light. And the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ shown into your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. See, isn't that incredible? Don't we want, we, I want that. I want the internal revelation of Jesus Christ. I want God the Father to reveal his son, not just to me, not just outwardly, not just externally, not just in a dream or a vision that's out here. I want the internal revelation of Jesus Christ to come to me 
and I'm sure you do as well, because this is how we are equipped as a messenger. See, Paul said, he, the Father was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might go and preach him to the Gentiles. See, we have nothing to give anyone if we don't have our own personal, internal revelation of Jesus Christ. We can never be a messenger of the Lord. We can never, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be behind a, in a platform with a microphone. You know, you can be a messenger in many, many different ways. Videos, music, writing, business. You can be, a, you know, one-on-one -on -one just with a small group, however. You can be a messenger in any setting, in any platform with your family. But we can never be a messenger of the Lord. We can never be a sent one unless we have an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul got that internal revelation of Jesus Christ in Arabia. Paul got that in the wilderness and solitude. And so don't despise the wilderness that you, would, you find yourself in. Don't despise that place of solitude, of confinement, of separation. If you find yourself there, God could very well be preparing you with an internal revelation of his son, Jesus Christ, so that you might be a messenger. And so Paul goes and, he, and he, he wants to stress the fact to the Galatians. He said, listen, guys, I've been in Arabia for three years. I've gotten an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, I didn't, even, I didn't go immediately to consult with flesh and blood. In fact, uh, chapter 2, he says, it took 14 years. 14 years before I, br I brought it to the 12 and said, okay, is this... Is this correct? Is what I'm teaching correct? Is my revelation of Jesus Christ accurate? Before I got their validation, Paul said, I waited 14 years. I didn't immediately go to flesh and blood. Basically, he's telling the Galatians, listen, the gospel I'm preaching came directly from God. The gospel I'm preaching, like Moses on Sinai, that same experience came to me in Arabia, where for three years, the revelation of Jesus Christ came to me. All that, I, all that Paul taught, or a lot of what Paul taught, at least in seed form, was deposited in that three-year time in Arabia. Verse 17, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia, which I've mentioned that many times, and I returned once more to Damascus. Verse 18, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, who is Peter. Cephas and Peter are the same, in case you don't know that. So I, so I went to Jerusalem, I stayed with Peter, I stayed with him for 15 days. And, and again, he's saying this to validate to the Galatians, I received this message from God himself. Verse 19, I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And so he's basically just reaffirming to them, I, this is truly the true gospel given straight from God. Verse 20, now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying so Paul was accused of not telling the truth. Paul was accused of distorting the gospel, not telling them the full gospel. He's ba they're basically being accused. They were saying something like this. Paul wants to win you to this. Paul wants to win you to his ministry. But you know what? It's kind of like the salesman tactic. Okay, what you know, you, you kind of have the sales funnel, and you bring them through step by step, and you want to get them to this certain place, and finally you unveil, this is what I'm really, my motive. And, you know, they're, they're accusing Paul. Well, he's not telling you about the law yet because he wants to win you, and then once he wins you and you, you believe him, then he's going to really sell you on that you've got to obey the full law. And Paul's like, no, I'm not lying. I'm not lying about this. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. Verse 21, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And so that's modern-day Turkey. Paul goes from Antioch area to Turkey area. And in verse 22, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they only kept hearing, verse 23, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. One of the just probably the greatest conversion in history. The churches all around, Paul was trying to destroy the church and he becomes 
the wise master builder of the church. That is the grace of God. So just as we bring this to a close, the application, just a few points of application for us is that we do not want to preach a false gospel. We want to get our gospel message correct. It cannot be tainted with legalism or with lawlessness because if we are tainted by legalism or lawlessness, we can be under a curse. The second thing is we want to be faithful to Christ and we do not want to be moved by the fear of man. We got to be delivered from the fear of man. It's impossible to be a messenger of God. It's impossible to be a messenger of Christ, a messenger of the gospel, if we have the fear of man still operating in us. We've got to be delivered from that. We've got to be delivered from being moved by praise, and we've got to be delivered from being moved by rejection and criticism. Way easier said than done. Way easier said than done. But, you know, we cannot let praise go to our head and we cannot let criticism destroy us because we cannot be moved by what men say. We've got to be moved by what Jesus Christ says and what he says about us. Third thing, we've, we hit on this. God is pleased to reveal his son internally to Paul. And I want to encourage you, go after an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. Some people want to have all these prophetic encounters and prophetic experiences and dreams and visions and trances. And, hey, I would love to have all of that. But you realize that we can have, by the Spirit of God, an internal unveiling of Jesus Christ, where God the Father reveals his Son to our spirit, to our heart. And that, I want to assure you, is very vital, very important. Paul's, Paul's basically saying, I had the external, but he had to do the internal revealing to prepare me as a messenger, to give me the full message. And it came on waiting on him. And finally, the last point, and as we bring session or chapter one to a close, is Paul spent a significant amount of time waiting on God. Three years in Arabia, and there's other, I'm sure throughout his life, he had other times and seasons of waiting on the Lord, listening to him, without an agenda, without a hurry, without a schedule. And then after many years, he went and consulted with others of, of reputation. And see, so what we do, what we do is we get a revelation from the Lord, and immediately we want to go validate that from someone. We want, we want immediate validation. It only reveals, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but, but, you know, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Let him slowly unveil these things to you. And as he reveals things, you know, over time you can validate it. And I, I know I'm, I'm thinking of one particular revelation of myself that the Lord has given me that I got back, you know, tw I don't know, 20 years ago, and just, you know, I haven't even talked about it much, but the first thing I want to do is, okay, what does this person think about it? What does that person think about it? What does the people of reputation think about it? What does that, you know, that person I esteem or that person I esteem say about it? And, and so sometimes the Lord doesn't want us to go seek out those of reputation. It took Paul 14 years to go to those of reputation to say, validate my gospel, and they did. Sometimes we just need to stew on the revelation and meditate on the revelation and just wait on the Lord as he prepares us as messengers of the gospel. Amen. We'll bring, that'll be the end now of uh, session one or chapter one, and then we'll, we'll get ready for chapter two, um, and then uh, we'll keep going. Amen.